Hey friends, I am here today for another episode and I have another amazing guest. So Colleen O'Grady is a psychotherapist with, and she has practiced over 50,000 hours, seen patients, helped them navigate things like relationships, anxiety, and really anything related to mental health, I'm sure. She has an incredible practice in Texas and Today, we are going to talk about the mother-daughter relationship. So obviously we're on, on video on Zoom right now. I can see Colleen, she can see me, but I can't see you. But I still have this urge to say, raise your hands if you're a mom and raise both hands if you're a mom of a teen girl. So I am, and I know that it is so different than raising my boys. And some days are just filled with, sugar and honey and sweetness and love and hugs. And some days are filled with rolls of the eyes and don't touch me, don't talk to me and leave me alone. So it's a, an emotional roller coaster. And we're going to dive into that today. We're going to talk about dialing down the drama and dialing up the dreams. The two titles of Colleen's books that she has written and her newest one is Dial Up the dreams. So we're going to just touch briefly on the first book, dial down the drama, and then we'll jump into some more deeper thoughts on dialing up the dreams, not only the dreams for your teen daughter, but the dreams for us too, when they go off to college. So we're going to dive right in here because I'm really excited to have this conversation. So hold on to your hats or your cup of coffee or whatever, because we're going to be talking about teen girls and who knows where this conversation will go. So Colleen O'Grady, welcome to the Robin Graham show. I'm so glad to be here. I'm happy to have you. I loved the book. And as a mom of a teen girl, it is hard. Now I grew up with three sisters and three of us were very close in age. And then the other one came many years later. So the three of us were really, I'm sure a challenge to go through the years of puberty and teenage years and getting us off to college and all those things. And I look back and I'm like, wow, my parents really, they really did do a good job despite the fact that they were throwing this chaos of three teenagers. But so you'd think I'd know a little bit about raising a teen girl. However, every single individual is unique and the mood swings or whatever are different for every single kid. And I, my daughter is a good kid and I love her. And she really is good about conversing and all those things, but that doesn't eliminate the challenges of the teenage years, because no matter what, there are always things that, that happen. There's always drama at school. There's always this, there's always that can come up to shift how the day goes in terms of our relationships. So let's start with you introducing yourself to us, tell us a little bit about you and really your journey as a psychotherapist, but how you decided to write these incredible books to help other moms raise their teen girls. Okay. I would love to. I did 10 years of full-time youth ministry uh, with Young Life. And then I probably volunteered 10 more years as a youth minister. And so I was immersed in the teenage world and hundreds and thousands of teens. And I would go, backpacking with them and I would take them on trips and small groups with them. And I was a rock star to teenagers. And then I became a marriage and family therapist. And so I'd seen the best of teens. And then as a marriage and family therapist, I worked in a medical school for 19 years in the child and adolescent department. And so then I saw the worst of teens. I consulted at the adolescent unit in a psychiatric hospital. So I saw the hard stories of teenagers. And then I have my own daughter. And so I had, I would have like kind of before teen and after teen. So I would speak at the Texas Association of Marriage and Family Therapist about individuation and blah, blah, blah. And then I had my own daughter and then it was like, oh, this is real. And so I'd been a therapist for 14 years. And then my daughter was like around 12. And that's where I went. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Cause I lost it. And I knew better. I was a therapist. Like, and she just totally pressed my buttons. And so then I was like, okay, what happened here? I was the coolest person to thousands of teens for those years. And then my daughter was looking at me like I was the worst thing ever. So I was like, what just happened? 
And so that sent me into this kind of soul searching place. And so it was soul searching, but it was also when I started to really pay attention to all the neuroscience. So the neuroscience really gave me the answers to what happened. And I had no idea. And not only just the neuroscience for the teenage girl, but also the neuroscience for us as adults, and especially understanding the stress response when we get emotionally flooded, that we can go into that fight, flight, freeze. And really no one was talking about that to mothers and what that really meant. And I think a lot of moms heard, oh my gosh, the prefrontal cortex is not fully developed till 25, but no one knew what exactly that meant. That is why I started writing Dial Down the Drama. It was based on the science, but then I made it like so mom friendly so that you go, oh, I totally know what you're talking about now. Mm -hmm. And I think that's such an important factor that the human brain doesn't develop until 25 or later. And that can be also very individualistic. Some kids are going to mature earlier. Some kids are going to mature later, but scientifically the brain, they're not capable of making good decisions, good judgments all of the time because their brain is not prepared for it yet. They're not ready for that yet. And the brain is so complicated. So when you throw in all these environmental factors coming at them, it makes it even harder to make good decisions. And I I love that you brought into play that fight or flight fight, flight, or freeze reaction because so many times, and I just recently had this conversation with my kids and I'm like, I was broken for a long time. And it wasn't until more recently and really writing my book helped me grow up a lot in terms of emotional stability and reducing my own anxieties and things like that. But really admitting that there were a lot, I've spent a lot of time in that fight or flight or freeze. And instead of communicating that mommy's kind of broken inside and I'm trying to navigate my stuff while I'm helping you navigate your stuff. And so thank God I'm in such a better place now that I'm raising my daughter, but it's so true as moms. And when we, especially when we're not sure how to handle something and we just immediately react versus taking a that deep breath, stepping away for a second and then coming back. So I love that you brought that into play because the It's empowering to know that we're not alone when Mm -hmm. these things happen and that Mm -hmm. it's actually just part of our genetic makeup and how our brain works. So let's talk a little bit about that in dial down the drama. You talk about that science. So maybe you can just give some like key things to look for with teen girls in terms of when that drama is going to be escalating versus, and then how we as moms can maybe be prepared or have a strategy in place. So when that happens, we don't go into fight, flight, or freeze. We actually can stay in our place of calm to address the drama that they're presenting to us. Yeah. Yeah. So this one thing that I'm going to tell y'all is worth listening to this whole hour or 30 minutes. And that is timing is everything. And so if your daughter is stressed, and really stressed, if she's hungry, if she's intoxicated, if she is angry, anytime she's emotionally flooded is not the time to have a conversation with her. And the same goes with you, mom. If you are irritated, if you are flooded, if you are really stressed out, if you're really angry, she just walked in the door and you're so angry, that's not the time to talk either. And it's not to say that it's bad to have feelings. It's just when you are emotionally flooded, either your daughter or you are offline from the higher brain, the problem solving part of the brain, you literally can't access perspective. So if she drives you crazy and mom, you say, you know what, I think I need to go to the store and you calm down or you call a friend, you run around the block. If your daughter's really upset, it can wait. I think it's so hard for moms because when we see that she just didn't clean her room or that she broke one of your rules, it feels like in that moment for a mom that you have to address it now. And if you don't, then you're failing as a mother, but that's actually not true. It's 
what you can do is just contain the situation. If she stumbles in drunk, it's not a great time to talk. You can just say, you know what? You just need to go to your room right now. And the reason why I know this is like you said, I have listened to 50,000 hours of moms and teens and these stories. And I'm one of you. I am one of you because I have, I feel that inner pull to do these things. And I just know it doesn't work. One other thing I would say to answer your question is moms, it's really helpful to know that your daughter is hardwired for drama and because of the prefrontal cortex and she's hardwired to make mistakes and it is not personal. And if moms, we can get that into our heads that it's not personal, even though she's saying your name and being ornery or whatever, it's just normal. And that doesn't mean that you don't discipline it, but just knowing that you're not a failure as a mom and you are completely screwed up because your daughter isn't perfect just helps you not go off the deep end. And fear for moms also is what throws us into fight, flight, and freeze. And there's so much great stuff to be afraid of for mother. So giving ourselves the moms time to calm down ourselves and talk ourselves off the cliff is really helpful. I love all of what you just said. And I, as you were talking, I'm thinking of different scenarios that I've been in with my daughter. And it's, there's, I think too, as moms, because we do have that sense of fear for their well being, And we do have so many pressures when you're sitting on the sports field and someone is saying, oh, my child has straight A's and my child was asked to play on this travel team and my child is in the play and my child, blah, 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 blah. And you're sitting there thinking, wow, my child is just average or will my child ever be that good? And you really have to focus on the fact that your child is your child and all she needs from you is unconditional love. And it's okay if she's just average. It's okay if she is just who she is. And we have to shut out those internal things, those other things that other people are saying and not compare because our daughter is our daughter. And I've learned this, like my daughter is, she's just independent. She does not care what other people are doing, what other people are saying. She wants to be with her friends. She wants to be social and all of those things, but she will wear what she wants to wear and she will do everything on her time. And I have to respect that. I can't force her into, okay, you need to dress up because this is what you're doing. Like I would want to look great. And if she wants to wear pajama pants, okay. She's comfortable. She's happy. She's content. It's really identifying those battles that you want to fight in quote unquote, and then letting them be who they are and discover their self. And then when those times come, when it's a challenge and you do have to discipline or you do have to reprimand and the drama is coming in so heavily, you can focus on that without having all those other outside influences and worries at the same time, because you can't navigate both at the same time. Yeah, it's challenging. But so I will say that I love having a daughter though. Yes. Yes. Even though that drama is just naturally there. And I am like that mother hen. So this is something that I think too correlates with what you just said, like that drama is going to happen. And we have to be cautious to not take it personal. And I know that historically, that would be my thing. Oh, she's embarrassed to me. Oh, she doesn't like me or my boys, whatever the case may be. I would take it personally, but we can't take it personally. That's Mm -hmm. our, that's where we have to tap into our own maturity and our own, own level of consciousness to make sure that we're setting that apart. Like she's being a teenage girl. She doesn't mean to offend me or hurt me. Yeah. 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 Okay. Go ahead. Okay. And I think another factor here is that we live in a culture of perfectionism. Yes. And we feel as moms that the pressure to be perfect moms and to have be a perfect mom, you have to have a perfect daughter or perfect son. And that can drive us into being these creatures that are very annoying to our daughters because we, they feel it. If they feel we are anxious about how they're doing, we're anxious about the data points, 
they feel that too. And then they feel like you don't care about me. And like you said, if just accepting your kid is who they are. And when we do that, we can actually enjoy them. And the reason why you dial down the drama in my first book is because you want to dial up the connection and drama kills the relationship. And there's a myth that they'll thank me later, or when she's in college, she'll appreciate me and, and it'll all be better. And that's not true. The relationship that you're building in these high school years is what's going to carry you forward in the emerging young adult years. So I love having a daughter too. You dial down the drama. You don't let the drama dominate the connection with your daughter. There is going to be drama, but you, that's, that's why I said you dial it down. I'm not saying you eliminate it, you dial it down and then you can be really intentional about connection. So when daughters, sorry, when moms, when I ask moms, what did you miss about your teenage daughter? Like when they had gone to college, there were a million things. Mom sent me so many beautiful texts because that connection of watching the movie and having the dog on the bed and together, every mom and daughter have their intimate personal things they do together. And that is what you'll miss when they leave. And so if you're drama all the time, you miss these really great moments with your daughter. Mm -hmm. And so I always like to say, you want to start with everybody's busy and everybody I call, I talk about the monitor a lot in dial down the drama and the monitor is really a monologue. It's not a relationship. We can confuse that as a relationship. But the monitor sounds like you need to get up, give me your phone, you need to do your homework, you need to go to bed. So we're just managing our teens. If you don't have any other facet to your connection with your daughter, you don't have connection. So you have to take that monitor hat off and set a goal for yourself for 20 minutes a day just to be present with your daughter and hang out. You don't always want to be the mom with a frown on her face. When she walks in the room, you want to be the mom that she sees you laugh. She sees you sm smile, that she wants to share things that she watched on TikTok, even though you think it's stupid. You want to be present for her at least 20 minutes a day. And that connection, when she sees that you're not going to always pounce on her or be on her for something that, that actually it's some part of the day that you enjoy each other then she lets you in more and more to her life. Mm -hmm. And I think that is so important. And I think as moms, it's our duty. And I think some moms are probably uncomfortable with this, but the one thing I've always said is there's nothing you can't tell me. That's not to say that you won't get in trouble or there will be repercussions later, but there's nothing you can't tell me and that we can't have a conversation about, because I think that is so important to know that they're not going to be judged. They're not going to be shamed. They can say whatever it is they need to say, whether it's trouble with a friend, whether it's getting drunk, whatever the case may be, they can come to you and you're not going to judge them or immediately react negatively. And I think that's one thing that I didn't really have. I was always afraid to tell my parents a lot of things. And so it's, I think that's a really cool thing to have that if you, your daughter or your sons can know they can come to you. And we always use the example, if you're at a party and you've been drinking, do not drive home. Do not get in a car with someone else that's been drinking. Call us. Are we going to be happy that you've done that? No, but we want you to be safe. So I think there's all these little things on top of acceptance of imperfection that is so important as a parent. Yeah. And as a therapist, I've seen the nightmare stories when the daughters can't talk to their parents and, it, and they get into situations where they're at a house and their drug dealers there and they're scared, but they feel like they can't call their parents because they'd be so mad and they get in deep. And this is like the cute little cheerleader. This isn't like bad kids. And it is, it's with my own daughter. I'm like, oh, you're telling me this, but it's great because 
I mean, there are things like if I had told my mom stuff, like she would probably have fallen on the floor, but, but when we know that then actually moms, we know when we look at it as a developmental issue, they are telling us that here's where I need help. Here's where I'm still immature. When you listen to that, if you don't hear it as, oh my God, I'm a failure and you are the worst kid ever. And you see it as where does my daughter need to grow? And I think that's what really discipline is. What is a consequence that can help her grow? But so for example, the party thing that she's drunk at a party. So you could say you're not supposed to drink kind of conversation, but that's not helping anything. What you want to find out is what happened. Did she feel the peer pressure to drink? Is it that she needs help in learning how to say no? What are the skills that she needs in those situations? Because I have been in, I was associate resident for a freshman dorm of 400 freshman girls. And I saw what happened when like just moms just controlled their daughters and just punished them versus equip them and give them skills. And those girls in freshman year would be passed out in the frat houses. The girls who had blown it and their parents had helped them get some skills, those things didn't happen. And this was three years in a row. So I saw the same things three years in a row. Yeah. And I think that all comes back to being open to conversations and connection. And I love so much that we're talking about connection and I'd love, we've hinted towards this. So as we move from dialing down the drama and building connection, we can move into dialing up the dreams. And you talked about powerless parenting messages and powerful parenting messages. And I loved how you broke these down and you gave examples of these, because I think there's so much truth to we can empower our daughters or we can take that power away. And so much of that depends on how we talk to them. Yeah. And those messages that we can convey. So will you talk about that for just a second? Yeah. So the powerless parenting messages are things that we just pick up from the culture and we feel the pressure that the culture puts on us. And we feel like if we do these messages, then we are being a good mom but they actually are not helpful at all. They render us powerless and they have a negative consequence on our daughters. So like in Dow Down the Drama, one of them, and this is universal for moms, is it feels like it's selfish to pay attention to ourselves or we need to put our family first and put our needs last on the list. And that just doesn't work because if we don't take care of ourselves and take care of our own well-being, then we are the worst version for our daughters. And then they don't want to have anything to do with us. It's a powerful parenting message to pay attention to ourselves, to Robin, you're so good at your own self-awareness. And so if you're like, I'm feeling anxious or I'm feeling worried, or I'm feeling this, that is good. That self-awareness can only happen if you pay attention to yourself. And when you pay attention to that, then you can take care of yourself. Now, senior year, there is a powerless parenting message that actually junior, senior year. And, and this is really not helpful. And the powerless parenting message is the end goal. My daughter's future is more important than my daughter's well-being and our relationship. And those junior, senior years. So that's the reason I wrote Dial Up the Dream. It's not like the principles of Dial Down the Drama don't fit in the second book, but really Dial Down the Drama is really from the preteen years up to through high school. And Dial Up the Dream picks up around junior, senior year. And why I wrote the book is starting in those junior, senior years is there is such a pressure to have a future focus and for the moms and for the daughters. And so we think as moms, like, oh my gosh, it's junior year. Now it's like really serious. And if they don't get it together with their grades, they're not going to have a good future. They're not going to get into a good college. That's all we can see as moms. This is the powerless parenting message is, oh my God, they're just, they're on TikTok. 
They're not, not doing what they're supposed to do. They failed the test. They don't, they're not caring. They're not doing their SAT prep work. They're not writing their college essays. Everything is the future focused. And it feels like as a mom, we've got to push them screaming and whatever over that finish line so that they can have a good future. And then they'll say, thank you, mom, for doing that. But the big problem with that is that you often, if you think of it, high school's four years. If two years, you just have this fixed future focus, you miss out on the connection and you miss out on really their well-being. I have, I want to encourage you moms to have a holistic view of success. Because if it's just, they made a 99, they got into Duke University, they got into Harvard University or the state high, whatever university, but they can be a complete total mess. And I've seen that. I've seen the girls who get into the really the Ivy League schools and their anxiety is off the charts. They hate their life. So this is not success. Uh -uh. So junior, senior year, you want to make room for the connection. You want to pay, be paying attention to their well-being. That is really what is the most important thing in those years. And yes, I'm not saying that the college stuff isn't important, but don't lose sight of the well-being and that relationship, because as soon as they back out of your driveway and go into to college, you're going to go, oh, I miss her so much. So I always say, don't miss these years. Don't miss them. And I think it's important too, to continue building that connection throughout those last couple of years versus just constantly nagging and putting pressure on them because they're creating their own pressures. I saw it with my boys. They have that sense of urgency. They have that sense of pressure. And if they're prone to anxiety, we are only worsening that. And I loved that you said they get this quote unquote success of getting into a certain school. But when that anxiety level is so high, they can't function well and they can't create relationships on their own. They struggle in every aspect of their life. And that anxiety is such a dear subject to me. And you, we can't force them into that frame of mind because we're doing them a disservice. And then we're going to do nothing but worry the entire time they're gone. And that's yes. not healthy for us either. Like when yes. they leave, we need to be able to do go about our lives and care for ourselves and do the things that we've been longing to do that we couldn't do because we had kids under our roof. Yeah. Um, so you talk about the six keys to healing conversation and the one, the very first one is have a clear motive. And I would like for you to talk about these six keys, because I think they're really important with not only communicating, but continuing to build that connection with our daughters and ensuring that when they do go away, they're going to come back and they may say, thank you. They may not say thank you, but at least they're going to come back and we're going to be able to have a long-term relationship with them versus sending them off. And they never want to come back because all we did was push them, nag them, say negative things to them, or have these powerless messages for so many years that they're not interested anymore. Healing conversations don't start off with a daughter coming to you and saying, mom, let's have a healing conversation. Often <laughs> they. <laughs> yeah, not expecting that. <laughs> so often what they come as is, is, is a very, I call the hard conversation is that, and it's, it happens in high school but there's still a lot of monitoring. So in college, this hard conversation is you think things are great. And it, this happens in high school too, but out of the blue, they come and you are attacked like 55 things you've done wrong. And it's all those fears of maybe I'm a bad mom. Maybe then they'll tell you, yes, you are a bad mom. These are the 55 things that are wrong. And it is so easy to get defensive. Of course, you're like, that is not true. Oh my gosh. You don't appreciate that. I did these 500 things for you and you're focusing on this. So it's very easy to get 
really upset, really hurt, really angry. And when I say a clear motive is often this attack on you is mothers always get blamed. Let's just be real here. But when they attack you, it's really about your daughter not being happy in her own life, her being stuck in her own life. It's really about her. And so she is just attacking you. So having a clear motive is really about, you probably are going to need to take a big pause before you come back to it. So there is usually a pause between the hard conversation and the healing conversation, like for you to go, okay, why did she just do that? Where is she hurting? So if you can say the motive here is my daughter's healing, that is the step one. I love that. Okay. And then, so you alluded to this, but the second key is slow it down. So, yes. So the hard conversation is it's 15 issues that they come and attack. And then they have created a big story about it that you haven't been a part of. And this can happen in high school is like with their boyfriend, they create a story about you, but in, in college, they are with their roommates and they create this huge story or even with their therapist, unfortunately, they create a story about you. And then they come and throw the story at you and they just, and you're like, what? And so slowing it down is just saying, just like, hold on, let's go back to when you said you never cared about me. Like you want to slow it down to one thing and you don't say it because the rest of it's junk. You say, because I really want to really hear you. And I really want to give you my full attention, but with, there's a lot that you're saying right now. So let's just go back to that one thing. Ooh, I love that. That's such great advice. And I can see that playing out with any relationship. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. And okay. So listen with curiosity and curiosity is one of my favorite words. Yes. So. It's a great word. Okay. And I'm, this is like a PhD course for moms really here in this healing conversation. So listen with curiosity is that basically we have just put judgment aside. And so when they're saying something, we, like the judgment comes up first and that's the defensiveness is you are so entitled. You are so immature. You are such a, like all that stuff comes up first. Mm-hmm. And that's why sometimes you might need a pause between that hard conversation and the healing conversation, but then you come back with curiosity and just say, okay, so tell me well, what were some of the things that happened that really communicated that I didn't care about you? I would love to know about that. And you get curious about what that is. And what's crazy is your curiosity actually softens her anger because they can tell it throws them off because you're not being defensive. And then they're less harsh. They say, mom, all you cared about last year was making grades. And you didn't even know I was so stressed out. You didn't even care about my breakup with my boyfriend you just cared about me doing well in my classes. Then you've got more info. And you can begin a conversation. Yeah. Or ask for forgiveness. <laughs> yes. Yes. And then, so the key four is take time. Yeah. This will seem really counterintuitive to moms because this is an uncomfortable conversation, but a principle I always share with my moms is you can have multiple conversations. Like in a text, you don't want to have 500 items in a text. Usually if you're communicating with your daughter, it's like one thing. So I think like a one topic conversation is really good, but just have a lot of those. Yeah. I like that suggestion. And when you bring it back up, it's, they're like, oh my gosh, she really cares. Yeah. And I like how you say, I'm just going to read this. It says to get back to that place of balance, meditate, go running, journal, garden, play guitar, pray, call a friend, take a nap, or find a distraction like shopping. 
And I love, <laughs> oh, and then you say you want to stay away from alcohol because numbing your feelings isn't the same as getting back to calm. I love that. The numbness is a false veil that can quickly slip when matters get heated. I love that you say this. So it's like the slow down, but we give ourselves that break, the, the grace to step away and gather our own thoughts and calm ourselves down. And that kind of goes hand in hand with self-care to make sure that we're in the right place mentally and physically, emotionally, to then have a deeper conversation that will allow us to continue to connect, but connect in an effective way versus just being defensive or going back after them versus letting this settle for a little bit and approaching it with a new mindset. Yes. Yes. I love that. Okay. And then own our part. And I think this is something that's really hard to do. Oh, it is so hard to do with my daughter. And yeah, this definitely applies to high school and middle school. When my daughter would do something, the first place we go as a mother is that is so rude. That is so wrong. And we don't think about our part in it. But I noticed that my daughter would get even more angry and more bowed up and more defensive. And so what I started doing is saying, okay, what can I own? And this is how I justified it. This is how I started off. Okay. I think my daughter is 99% wrong. So what is my 1%? So that made it easier for me to do that. Say, I just need to own my 1% or my 0.05% here. So I would go to my daughter. Actually, when you said that I was stressed out or this is all about my own fears or my own worries, you were right. And I was really intense and I want to apologize for that. And the huge surprise for me is that my daughter would say, oh, that's okay, mom. I was really hard on you too. So what I ended up doing when I owned my part, which feels like defeat to a mother, but when I owned my part, it was the exact opposite. She softened and I modeled to her how for her to own her own part every time she would follow suit. Yeah. I love that. We've had that same thing in our house and it, it, it's a moment that I can't even describe because it's okay. I am doing an okay job. If she can realize that and apologize too. Yes. Or take some blame, take own some of this too. And yeah. I love this paragraph that you say, owning some of the blame, seeing some truth in what she says doesn't mean you're a horrible mom. It means you're human. Parenting is hard and the right thing to do isn't always obvious. Don't make excuses for yourself. Just own up to your part so her healing can begin. I just love yes. that. Yes. I love it. So then the very last key, and then we'll start to wrap up our conversation is offer a heartfelt apology. And man, is that sometimes hard? <laughs> yeah, we can give really lousy apologies. And so I'll give some examples of that before I get into heartfelt ones is okay. I'm sorry. That's one. That's not a heartfelt apology. No. Or, okay. So I'm sorry, but you should have studied last night. So I have to stop you right there because in my book, I have that very same thing in my book. I talk about that, that to say, I'm sorry, but, and then put the responsibility back on the kid. No, that's not an apology. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there are so many apologies that will just make your daughter really more angry because they know it's not a good apology because if they did the same thing to you, that would make you angry. So a heartfelt apology is the time that you pray, meditate, walk on the beach and do all of that. And I do think it's a God gift that just pops inside of you that just changes you. And you just go, oh, I get it. I get it. And it, it takes empathy to see it from her perspective and her age and her context and so a heartfelt apology is, I'm sorry that I blah, blah, blah. And I can see how that impacted you, blah, blah, blah. And here's what I'm going to do to change that. Here's what I'm going to do to be more mindful, to not do that again. Yeah. And mindfulness is so key. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh gosh. I could talk to you about this forever. I feel like I just had my <laughs> own little therapy session for raising my daughter, but your book is, I have not read dial down the drama, but I'm going to order it today because now that I've read dial up the dream, I want to go back and really make sure that I, for the next few years, am spot on with raising her. Cause I want that relationship with her when she's in college and after college to want to cuddle up on the couch and watch a movie or lay on the bed and play with the dogs. Like we do now. I don't want that to ever go away. It's just yeah. too priceless. Yeah. So thank you so much for sharing all of this with us. Oh, what were you going to say? I was going to give a story. Okay. Give a story. Okay. Yeah. So my daughter was a senior. I had just come home from work. She was on the floor and the laptop was open and she goes, Hey mom, you want to look at this? And I just wanted to change clothes. I wanted to relax. When our daughters initiate, it's always, it's just never comfortable. And it's, it's always an inconvenience, but I said, okay. And so I walked in and I watched the, this little video and it was Josh Groban, which is not typical for her music taste. It's something I like. And so I was watching this video and I said, oh my gosh, that's my bucket list. And then I was trying to change clothes and she goes, mom, I said, what? She goes, he's going to be here in two weeks. And I said, okay. She goes, let's go. And I thought I worked that night. I can't go. That's what I was thinking. But then I'm looking at my senior daughter wanting to, to go to a concert with me to a concert I like. And I said, you've got to go. And so I said, sure, let's do it. And then she goes, mom, there's two tickets like on the second row. And I'm like, oh. I usually buy the, like the last seat in the auditorium tickets. But I said, yeah, let's do it. Oh my gosh. So we go and then we get there and she goes, mom, let's take a picture in front of the stage. I am I'm like, this is not my normal daughter. Like she doesn't want to get a picture with her mother in front of people. So we get a picture in front of the stage, like we're besties. And then I'm watching on the second row and Josh was singing to me the whole time. So I was smiling and my daughter kept looking at me and she was smiling. And so after the concert, she goes, aren't you glad you didn't miss it? And I said, yes. And so we walked back to the car and we're talking. It was all exciting. And then when we, when we got in the car, she gets back on her phone and boom, gone back into her teenage world, but I didn't miss it. And so that's what I want to encourage your moms out there is you don't want to miss those moments, even though it's inconvenient, even though it's maybe a little bit risk, but don't miss those moments. Cause those are the moments you're going to come back to. And you'll never forget them. Yeah, that's beautiful. And it's so true. It's so true. And it is, it's always when you're right in the middle of something, they want yes. you and, and, but it's okay. I have to stop. And sometimes it takes a lot of effort. I really want to just get this thing done, but yes. it's so true. That is such great advice. Such great advice. Colleen, thank you so much for being here. I love that you're not only giving us this information from the perspective of a therapist, but from a mom who's been through it. And I think that just adds this really thick layer of proof, just social proof that, okay, I've been through it. You can do it too. Yes. So thank you so much for sharing all of this with us and for being here. How can the listeners learn more from you, connect with you? I will definitely put the link to your website and the books in the show notes so people can yes. just click and find them. But anything else you want to share with how they can connect with you? Yeah, my Facebook page and my Instagram page, you can connect with me there. And I always add some wonderful thing there. But yes, also is just like you have a wonderful podcast. I have a podcast called Power Your Parenting Moms with Teens podcast. And you've been a guest. People loved your show and your episode. So you can come and listen to my uh, podcast. Yeah. And she, you guys so good. Just like we just had this conversation. She has incredible guests and she gives so much value and her guests do too. Anyway, 
Thank you so much for being here. And I am just grateful that you're here to support us and that I get the opportunity to host you and support you too, because this is information that we all need. And I want to get it out to as many people as I I can possibly help you get it out to. Thank you. Thank you so much. Listeners, I will see you next week.